Okay, this is the uh, first talk I've given since November 2019, so I also didn't know all of you would be here. I thought it would be quite a small talk because there's other more popular speakers on, so that's a bit of a shock. So I'll be a little bit rusty, so uh, please bear with me. Um, but I'm here to talk today about Ansible and Windows, and how in particular PowerShell enables how PowerShell enables Ansible, which is a Linux configuration manager, to work in a Windows world. Before we start, though, I want to say thank you to all the sponsors for sponsoring the event this week, and then tell you who I am. So my name is Paul Broadwith. I'm a technical engineer manager at Chocolatey Software. So me and my team are responsible for the chocolate products that some of you will be using. Um, I'm based in Glasgow in Scotland, and I've got over 30 years in IT um, in various different sectors from manufacturing, financial, defence, all sorts of different places. I'm also a Microsoft MVP for Cloud and Data Center, and I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer as well. So this flag here kind of reminds me to tell all of you that in Scotland we tend to talk quite fast. So I know not everybody's first language is English, so if I'm speaking too fast, particularly as there's far more people here today than I thought there was going to be, a little bit nervous, uh, then please let me know, put your hand up, let me know to slow down a little bit. Okay. So the agenda for today, we're going to do a little bit of history of Ansible, first of all. Important to kind of understand you know, where Ansible came from. We'll cover that in a couple of minutes. Then we'll talk about the Ansible infrastructure itself, how Ansible communicates in particular uh, with Windows, because that's what we had to talk about today. Um, how Ansible works on Windows. Is it PowerShell? Maybe, maybe not. We'll have a look at that. And there's also a little bit of a demo where we, uh, I put there write an Ansible module. The module's already been written, but we're going to go through how you would write an Ansible module and what the kind of best practices for that today. So this is a kind of introductory talk, um, to cover some of those areas and how to write that module for Windows. And then there's questions. Now, the talk today is only 30 minutes long. We've got 15 minutes for questions at the end. So, like probably you've seen all the other speakers say, if you can keep the questions to the end, that would be appreciated. So, the too long didn't read history of Ansible. So, Ansible was actually first written in February 2012, and it was written by Michael Dehan. Michael worked at Red Hat. And he worked at uh, Puppet, and he worked on a couple of projects at Red Hat called Cobbler, and one called Funk. Well, it's like function, but without the shin. That's basically what the, the it was. And he took those experiences and experiences with the when he worked at Puppet, and he created Ansible from that. And then in 2013, he created a company to wrap that around, um, and that was Ansible Works. And then he changed the name from Ansible Works to what we know today as Ansible in January 2014. Uh, the big important milestone for us Windows users is in August 2014, Ansible 1.7 was released with Windows beta support. Uh, we're currently at Ansible Core version 2.13, so it's come a, a long way since then. Uh, we've had Windows support for eight years, and it's it's pretty mature. Um, but it's, it's interesting to note that uh, only two and a bit years after Ansible was actually first written, Windows support was added. So um, Ansible, the Ansible team, Michael in particular, would have seen the importance of configuration management on Windows. Then we move on to October 2015, and we kind of come full circle a little bit because Red Hat bought Ansible. So Michael worked at Red Hat initially. Red Hat then buys Ansible. And then IBM comes along in July 2019. And that's where we are today, and they bought Red Hat, and obviously, therefore, Ansible, for $34 billion. So while I was researching this talk, um, I discovered what the word Ansible actually meant. It's something that's never actually occurred to me. What does Ansible mean? It's just the name of a product to me. But um, it was actually coined by uh, Ursula K. Le Guin in 1966, or published in her book in 1966, called Rakanen's World. Now, if you kind of look online, you'll see some people saying, well, it was really used in Ender's Game. And from what I understand, never having read that book, that um, in Ender's Game, it's fleshed out a little bit more. But um, Ursula K. Le Guin was the one that came up with the name Ansible. And it describes an answerable device or instantaneous communication system. So it's kind of appropriate for Ansible itself. So Ansible infrastructure, the bit we're interested in from a Windows perspective. So I'm hoping this diagram comes out okay. Um, the bit we're going to be concentrating on to begin with is a little yellow box. And it's really um, to talk about the Ansible control node. So that's the, the bit that um, does all of the work and communicates with all the devices. 
Um, and the Ansible control node only runs on Linux, really important to specify. So we're talking about Windows here today, but your Ansible control node does not run on Windows. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides in the future. Um, but the two boxes we're going to concentrate on is a little flag type boxes, playbooks, modules, plugins and roles, and then we'll talk about inventory. So playbooks to begin with, just a very high level overview. If people know Ansible, I'm not going to dig into detail, so it's okay. Um, playbooks are really like your script. That's where you start with Ansible. Your, your code, what it's going to do, what the configuration is that it's going to uh, assert onto your hosts. Okay? <clears throat> and they, that uh, playbook can include modules and roles as well and other stuff. <clears throat> Then we've got modules. Modules is a type of plugin. Okay, modules is what we're going to be looking at today. But plugins, uh, sorry, modules are slightly different from other types of plugins in that modules run on the actual hosts themselves. Okay, um, and in this uh, case, as I'm, I'm saying, we're, we're going to be looking at PowerShell on Windows hosts. Okay, but if we're looking at Linux, they run in Python. Plugins, as I said, uh, different from modules, but plug modules is a plugin. They run on the actual Ansible control mode. Okay, and they're written in Python. And they just extend Ansible's uh, functionality, core functionality a little bit. And roles is really amalgamation of, of kind of other things. So you'll uh, maybe have a Windows baseline role, let's say, and that includes things like configuration files, templates, um, default variables, and the actual code as well, which is a, bit, a little bit like a playbook. And because it's all related, they put it all together and they call it a role. And then underneath that, uh, we've got inventory. So Ansible needs to know about the hosts. Okay, you need to tell it effectively what the hosts are, where they are, and all the information about those hosts. So you can have two different types of inventory. You can have a static or dynamic inventory. Uh, all of the, I should actually say, all of the code for Ansible is written in YAML. So anybody who loves YAML will love Ansible. Um, and the inventory is no different. So your local uh, static inventory was just a, a YAML file, and it'll have information about the host. It could be the IP address, how it communicates. In Windows case, we have to tell it's a WinRM if we're using that. Um, and other information, you know, variables, and you can go mad in there. But um, you've got to give it the information about the host. But you can also have a, a dynamic inventories. And that could be from the cloud, so AWS, Azure. It could be from your CMDB. Um, it could be from Active Directory. And what you would do is pull that information in, put it into the format Ansible needs, and there you go, you've got an inventory, and it's a dynamic inventory. And using a tool such as Ansible Tower, Ansible Automation Platform, or AWX, which is Ansible, uh, sorry, Red Hat's uh, and Ansible's uh, front-end, kind of GUI-based uh, version of Ansible, if you like, um, you can do that on a cadence and set all that up, and it will do all of that for you. Um, and then finally, if we look at the top there, we've got Ansible Galaxy, and that's a bit like PowerShell Gallery. So you've got on PowerShell Gallery, you've got scripts, you've got modules, etc. It's just the same for Ansible Gal uh, Galaxy. You would have roles, plugins, modules, what they call collections as well, which is plugins, roles, and modules all in the one thing. So you would have the Ansible Windows uh, collection, for example, includes lots and lots of things. You could have a collection, I've got collection, I've not published it on Ansible Galaxy. You could have it on GitHub, you know, all these kind of things that you would put in there. So it's really like a shared repository of, of code for Ansible. Okay, And all of that comes down and makes the Ansible config that you're then going to take and apply it to your hosts, Okay, to assert that state, that configuration. So Ansible will communicate with hosts in different ways. So Linux, for example, which is the default, it will communicate through SSH, as you probably guess. Windows hosts that can actually communicate through WinRM or OpenSSH. Now, the OpenSSH support for uh, Windows hosts is restricted, is probably the best word, but not because of Ansible, but because of the nature of OpenSSH and how it works on Windows. But that's maturing over time, and that will get better. So ultimately, we could be communicating with Windows hosts over SSH as well. Um, you could also have networking devices, Cisco devices, Juniper, wh whatever. Um, and you, again, depends how you communicate with them. It could be over SSH, it could be an API. And so we can talk to them as well. And then you've got cloud services, Azure, uh, AWS, GCP, whatever. Um, it communicates with them over the API as well. So you could provision virtual machine, load balancer, application gateway, all the networking. Wait for the machine to come up, and then Ansible will actually provision the machine itself as well. So it'll do the whole gamut of things. So how does Ansible actually work on Windows? <coughs> So Ansible has minimum requirements for Windows, as you probably expect. Now, skipping the first one there, because we'll come to that in a second, the minimum requirements are really PowerShell 3 and .NET 4. 
Okay. Um, and if you're using WinRM, that's got to be configured in listening. That's fairly obvious. And um, if you're using OpenSSH, that'll need to be installed and be configured as well. But the Windows Server 2012 and Windows 8.1, the, the first line there, is what Ansible tests against. Okay, they used to test against Windows 7 in 2008, R2, 2008 as well. But because that's went out of support, they're not testing against that anymore. But that doesn't mean Ansible won't work on those, those uh, devices, those operating systems, okay? If it meets PowerShell 3 and .NET 4, you're probably going to find that it'll work fine. Maybe in the future, your mileage will vary a little bit, but at the moment, you'll probably be okay. Um, so it's, it, it's important to kind of point that out from your, your uh, minimum requirements for your operating system there. As I mentioned a couple of slides ago, the Ansible control node cannot run on a Windows host natively. Okay, um, a chap called uh, Matt Davis, I believe he worked at Ansible, he may still work at Ansible, actually took uh, the Ansible code base and tried to run it on Windows. And he, when he started doing that, he looked into it, and there's a lot of what he called Unixisms built into Ansible. It was built for uh, Linux initially, Unix uh, initially. Um, so he his uh, view on it was it would either be impossible um, or almost impossible to to do without rewriting the entire code base of Ansible. So you're not going to get an Ansible control node running on Windows natively anytime soon, if at all. But that doesn't mean we're left out high and dry. So the options to run your Ansible control node on Windows <coughs> is a Windows subsystem for Linux, Linux virtual machine, Docker containers, um, we'll come to side going in a minute. The, the, those three I've actually used in the past. I currently use Windows subsystem for Linux, and that's what I'm going to do my demos on um, when we come to them. Linux virtual machine works fine, Hyper-V or whatever your virtualization of choice is. And there's many, many Docker containers on Docker Hub that will run Ansible, or alternatively create your own. It's fairly straightforward to install. Um, <clears throat> the uh, what, One of the things that, that was a problem in previous versions of Ansible was Installing it in anything that wasn't a Red Hat flavored. Okay, so RHEL, CentOS, um, Rocky Linux wasn't a thing at the time. Um, these were, if you were installing it on Ubuntu, for example, there was more hoops to jump through. It can be done, but it was more hoops to jump through. Now, um, Ansible have, uh, or Red Hat have taken the view that you can install it on pretty much anything that's got, uh, Python 3.8 and, uh, as a minimum on the, on Linux. Um, so, that's that's really what we can do now with with uh, Ansible. Um, if you're going to communicate with uh, Windows hosts, you need Pi WinRM module as well, and there's a minimum 0.3.0 .0 version that uh, you need to install. But if you're installing Ansible now, you won't actually have that module installed by default. You need to install it yourself. So trying to use it on Windows hosts out of the box doesn't work. You just need to install that additional module, and it'll be fine. Side going, I said I would, I would skip. It's not officially supported. Um, I know people do run it. I know it works for them. I don't know what mileage they get out of it, whether it completely works or not. But if, if it's something you want to run as a, you know, directly on Windows, that might be an option for you as well. But that's not supported by Ansible. <clears throat> so writing your first Ansible, Windows Ansible module. So the code, as you would probably expect, is in a PowerShell script. So Ansible runs Python on Linux boxes, but Python's not natively available on Windows. So all of the code for your uh, modules, your Windows modules, are all PowerShell. We've got little bits of, uh, well, we'll come and see, little bits of code that, that Ansible requires you to add in there, but it's all PowerShell. The documentation, on the other hand, is a Python script. And if you've ever written context-based help for any of your PowerShell functions or scripts, it's basically the same as that. It's like a different uh, uh, structure, but basically that's what it is. <clears throat> if you're um, writing uh, modules as well, try not to use write host debug or verbose or error. The reason for that is it will actually pollute the output stream that is sent back to Ansible. There is ways you can debug uh, PowerShell scripts or PowerShell Windows modules, should I say, um, and they're running through uh, Ansible, but there's, and that's on the documentation, I'm not going to dig into that, but there's ways you can do it so um, that you can uh, skip that that um, uh, output stream, putting that output stream. Um, exceptions and errors can be returned back to Ansible as well. Ansible is quite friendly in the, the, you know, you tell it things that will actually present that to the end user. So when they're running the code, they can see what went wrong rather than a generic error um, that's thrown back to them. 
Um, you can also specify a minimum PowerShell or OS requirement. So as I said in a previous slide, you needed PowerShell 3, um, and it was Windows Server 2012 and, and Windows 8.1. They were, as I said, that was what Ansible tested against, and that was the minimum. So you can say, for example, oh, this module needs Windows 5, uh, sorry, Windows 5, PowerShell 5, or Windows 10, for example, or, or some other combination of that. That's perfectly fine to do. And modules are run when they're run under uh, Ansible, they're run under script mode version 2. So if you're writing your modules and you're testing your modules, you should add that in there to the modules as well, because that will obviously help you compare apples with apples when Ansible's running it. So we're going to go and look at a demo, and um, I'm going to grab some water first. And what I want to show first of all is um, some of the Ansible Windows collection. Okay, so I'm hoping this comes out okay. I did stand up there earlier on and it looked pretty good to me. Is, does that look okay for everybody at the back? Awesome. <clears throat> so we're going to look at uh, the Ansible Windows collection and we're going to look at two modules that have been written. One fairly straightforward, one a bit more complicated. Um, but what I am really want to show you here is how uh, the, the Ansible bits that you have to add into PowerShell work. So there's what we call the... Uh, Hold on, grab that. Win ping module. Okay. As something I didn't mention earlier on, I probably should have done, was that um, Ansible modules, when you're running on Linux, so we've got the p win ping there. Just use that one as an example. Running on Linux, there's an alternative to that, and it's called ping. In Windows, it's win underscore ping. And that's the way Ansible name all of its Windows modules and things. Okay, it's win underscore, win underscore. But on Linux, the, the win underscore prefix is gone. So you don't have to do that if you're naming your things, but it's one of those um, best practices you would do. Okay, we've got lots of best practices in PowerShell. Ansible's got them as well. So win ping, uh, what it does is it will, you, you tend to use it when you want to test communication. Okay, I want to test I can actually communicate with that Windows host. So it will go away, it will uh, communicate, it will log in, WinRM, it will run the script, it comes back and goes, everything was successful, I can communicate. So that's all it does. Um, in Linux, I'll obviously do it through SSH. But there's a couple of important bits I'm going to point out, I'm hoping that can highlight and that comes across well, is uh, the Ansible basic. So you've got, you know you've got um, hash requires for PowerShell modules. Ansible's got it as well, Ansible requires. And we need this Ansible basic uh, one here because down here we're going to use it and I'll come to that in just a second. So you might notice there's actually no parameters in this script, but that's Ansible parameters. So that's just a hash table. And in that hash table, we've got options. And in that options, we've got data. So in your playbook, you can have a data field. Okay. Um, when you're using WinPing, you tend not to use it, but I'm, you know, it's there. And you're defining it as a string and you're giving it a default value as well, in case that's necessary. So that's really, really simple. Uh, the Win environment one we're going to come to is a bit more complicated, but that shows you that you can still do that and it will feed back into the playbook and you can uh, use those fields as well. And then what we do is we just create a module object, uh, sorry, a uh, Ansible module object and we assign it to the module variable there and what that does is it just creates all of that that you can use down here for example it's got the parameters for data okay and there's other stuff we'll come to uh, in a second I'm going to take this off because it keeps clicking give me a second there we go and um, down here if we pass the data field in and we've got crash in there it will throw an exception and um, nine times out of ten you won't use that but you know that shows you that you can actually reference those parameters and those fields. And then down here, I'm going to skip the, the module result part, but you've got module.exit.json. Okay. And so we'll need JSON back to it. And that there will actually do all of that work for you. Okay. So that's a really simple Windows PowerShell module. And you can see how the little Ansible bits or the little, uh, the Ansible bits, yeah, at the bottom and the top there, and you kind of wrap your PowerShell script around that. So the win environment one is a little more complicated. Um, I'm not going to dig into it too much, but I'm going to just show you the differences and the things that you can do, because that looked really simple, and how on earth are you going to get all your PowerShell information from that? So we've got the same thing again, that Ansible basic in there, and we've got an additional one, Ansible.modulerTiles.add type. So you can actually add types into your PowerShell script if you add that in. Okay, and we'll show you that in just a second. But again, you've got that hash table. Okay. 
Um, and the important thing here is that you've got lots of fields in this one. You've got name, level, state, value, and you've got variables. Um, all of them, with the exception of variables, are all strings. Uh, level has particular options that you must select, machine, process, user, and it's a required one. State can only be absent or present. The variables there, we'll skip over it, but it's just going to be a dictionary. We don't talk about that in, after this. And then you can say that some of them have got to be mutually exclusive. So you can see that you can actually get quite complicated because you know when you're writing PowerShell script, your parameters can be quite complicated in the sense that you can have one here and not one there and have that one. You can do all of that with Ansible as well. And then you're saying here, I require one of these. These have, One of these has got to be in here. If it's not Ansible, we'll throw an exception. Um, Windows talk, it won't throw an exception, but it does its Ansible equivalent. Again, we're setting up that module uh, object with all the information in there. And I'm going to skip, this is just PowerShell code, so I'm just skipping it. Um, but with what I wanted to show you was, here's the type we're adding. Okay, so we're adding just this type in here. And the way we can add that is because we had the uh, requires Ansible at the top there with the, the, the uh, add type, the C-sharp type. And then we'll skip down to the bottom. And we exit with JSON again, exactly the same as we've done with WinPing. One of the ones I wanted to pick out here, and it's something I used in my module, is you can actually send back to Ansible to say something has changed. So Ansible can run and nothing changes, but so it won't know that unless you say, hey, I've actually changed something here. Okay, or I haven't, and it'll, it'll register that. So you can assign that there, and again, that module uh, object, when it returns back, Ansible knows what's happening. So we're going to look uh, a little bit, yeah, we're going to look a little bit at the chocolatey collection. So remember I mentioned collections that you can have. So that Ansible.Windows there is actually a collection. Okay, you've got uh, modules in there, you've got plugins, you know, you see all of that. That's that sort of collections, all of the, all of the things in there, not just one. So we'll look at the chocolatey one for a little bit and pick out. You can see the structure as well, the folder structure. Very, very set out. So that it makes it, all of them will be the same way. It makes things easier to find. We like things that are in its structured order. And the one I'm going to look at is, uh, the one chocolatey facts. It's something I didn't, it's something I mentioned, but I didn't actually show you was the documentation. So that's a Python script there with the documentation. Let me just jump up to the top of that. And as I said, it's a bit like the, the, the help we write for chocolatey functions, chocolatey scripts. You've got there the description, for example. Um, you've got examples further down. You've got return, which is like, you know, the PowerShell output. So it's all there, just in a slightly different format. But that information is all there for you to, to add in. And that will get pulled into the documentation. And this is the uh, one chocolate facts. So I think if you use any uh, configuration management tool, I'm thinking of Puppet in particular, there's a, a, it gathers facts when it, it connects to a machine, and that's like environment variables and various other things. Um, so chocolate has the same sort of thing. So when you run uh, the one chocolate facts, it gathers facts about chocolate. Okay. And in this case, it's going to gather information about the configuration, the sources, the features, the packages that are installed. Okay. Ansible does that as well. Ansible has a fax thing and it, as I said, environment variables, etc. It's the same sort of thing, this one just specifically for chocolate. But again, you've got the same again. You've got the spec hash table. You've got the options. This doesn't need any parameters at all. Okay. Because you're just saying, Gar gather me the fax. There's nothing to tell it to what to do. It knows what to do. But you'll notice here as well, that set strict mode version two is there. Remember I said that uh, Ansible runs its PowerShell code or its Windows modules under uh, strict mode version 2. So that's been added in so that we can make sure that works. Um, and again, I'm just going to jump to the end. You've got the exit JSON again. Always that exit JSON to return that back to Ansible so it knows what's happened. So that's that's really us looked at some examples of modules. Now I've written a very, very straightforward uh, module. And I've had to create a hosts file, which we're going to have a look at, and I've created a playbook as well. Let me just close that down. I'll get into that hosts file. So the hosts file, if you remember, uh, I was talking about you've got to tell Ansible about your hosts, okay? Otherwise, it can't 
contact the machine, it doesn't know what to do. Um, so here, because the, the, this is the name, and it's not going to be resolvable by DNS in any way whatsoever, I have to give it an IP address. So this is the IP address of the connection I've got just now. I've told it here that I'm not, I'm just using an insecure WinRM, we're not using certificates or anything like that. I, I know I'm a bad boy, but uh, we're just doing this as a, a demo. Don't do this in production. We're connected through WinRM, that's the port, and we're using NTLM. Okay, it's very, fairly straightforward. It knows then how to connect to that host and how to get to it. We look at the playbook. The playbook here is, um, do you remember I mentioned the gather facts? That's how Ansible would do it. It does it by default, so you've got to say false. Turn it off, don't want to do it. So it takes a few seconds every time it connects and gathers facts. Um, and then you've got the task, I'm just creating this demo file. That's the name of the module I've created. Okay, poly.psconf.eu2022, win underscore, uh, psconf.eu2022 underscore file. Okay, it's a fully qualified name. So, um, so Pobby's my kind of namespace, psconf.eu2022 is like a collection, and then you've got the actual name of the module at the end of that. Uh, then we've got the name of the file we want to create, and then with the state, I'm actually going to put present on there rather than absent, because I wanted to create it first of all. So as simple as that. We're going to look at the actual code. The code's very, very simple as well. And there it's there. So we've had added, added the Ansible requires line. So we can create that, uh, that PowerShell object down here. We've got the options. I've put name and state. State has to be absent and present, just like the other ones we looked at. No different. And then we've created the, uh, PowerShell object there sing some variables, and then we'll just get into the code. And what this does is it hard codes a path. That's not a good thing to do, but it's a demo. Um, and then it creates the path of what the, the actual file we want to create. And the file is called after the name, whatever name value you give to the in the playbook, it creates the file called that. It then creates the folder if it's not there. So the folder's just the root path in there, but creates it if it's not there. And by default, we're saying we're not changing anything. And then we're saying, okay, if the file exists and you're saying it should be absent, remove the file and change the result to the, the uh, changed result to true. So I've changed something. I've removed a file. The state of that system has changed. Or if the file doesn't exist, but you're saying you want it to exist, i.e. it's present, I'm going to create a new item. I'm going to create a new file and I'm saying I've changed the state again and then passing that back to Ansible. And then we're exiting with JSON. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is you remembered, uh, as you, I mentioned before, about um, the right error, right host, all that kind of stuff. Don't pollute the output stream back to Ansible. If you're doing things like new item, it returns an object. That's going to pollute the output stream as well. So it's not just those right functions. Um, so what I've done there is just pipe it out to null. And we've done the same up here when we're creating that folder as well. Okay. If, if in this case, when it uh, runs that without out null, it actually doesn't affect anything. But Ansible says, I noticed there's additional stuff in the output stream I'm not expecting and warned you, but it doesn't actually change what we are doing. But it's good practice to do things like that. So that's just a really, really straightforward Windows module. That's all it does. It creates a file and removes a file. And this is us going to run the code now. So I'm just going to get that there. Um, make sure the file doesn't exist. And then we're going to, uh, yep, that's fine. I've done that earlier, so don't need to worry about that. And we're going to do one ping. Okay. This is the one. If this doesn't work, we've all finished because, uh, yeah. And there we go. So what it returns is pong. So ping pong. Okay. And it's saying that I can communicate with the machine. So this is running from WSL on my machine and communicating with my laptop. Okay, um, and it's successfully communicated. Um, and then I'm going to show you that there's, that folder doesn't exist. Okay, on the C drive on my machine, PSConf EU twenty twenty two doesn't exist. The folder that we we hard coded into the module. So I'm going to execute the playbook. Actually, I'm going to put this away. We don't need that anymore. Good. More screen. Now you can see down here, changed. Okay, because we changed the state of the system. And the state was, I remember we said, if we go back to the playbook, we said down here, we wanted to make sure that file was present. 
And we showed it just before that step that that folder didn't exist, that the file and folder doesn't exist, okay? So if we then go back and have a look, we can see the file now exists, okay? We've just created it, very simple, created it. If we run that playbook again, bear in mind it still says present, It says, yep, it's okay, I ran it, it's fine. It's all successful, nothing's changed because you said present and the file's still there. So we go back to the playbook and we just do absent. We just confirm again that that file's there. Okay, PS Confi U2022 test. And we execute that now. What will happen is it'll run it and it'll have changed something because it's removed the file, sorry. And then if we go back to this, the file's not there. And if we run that again, what happened last time, it okay, but nothing will have changed. And there you go. So that's a really, really simple Windows PowerShell module for Ansible, okay? Using that changed variable as well, because you're thinking, well, does it matter if it's changed? Well, it does if you're using tools that'll actually uh, pull in reports to see what's changed, that state's been updated. And um, it could be something like, why is the state of that machine changed? We need to look into that. And if your script is telling it the state has changed, then that's important. So that's the demo part of it. As I said, incredibly simple, but you build on that. And you see the Win Environment module as well. It's, you know, a lot of code in there doing a lot of things. So, a summary. We know what the Too Long Didn't Read History of Ansible, 2020, 2012 when it was written, to 2019 when IBM bought Red Hat. We understand the Ansible infrastructure, where it communicates particularly with Windows hosts via WinRM and OpenSSH. We know who, how Ansible works on Windows and how it does not run as a control node on Windows. Remember I talked about those Unix-isms that are part of the Ansible core, that it won't run natively on Windows, but we have the options of WSL, Linux, uh, virtual machine, and we have SideGwin, and we have a Docker container as well. There's probably other options, but those are the, the kind of main ones. And we know how Ansible modules are structured. So we have that folder structure that I showed you, how it was all laid out. We have the bits we have to wrap our PowerShell script in to do with the hash table to, uh, for the, the fields that we can put in our playbooks and the exit.json part at the end. So that is my talk today. Um, I'm hoping you guys got a lot out of it. But has anybody got any questions for me? Okay. The Ansible modules? Yes. Uh, no. Um, the, the, the question was, since I work at Chocolatey, I'll have written the Ansible modules for Chocolatey. So Chocolatey has the, ans uh, the Chocolatey Ansible collection. So you're asking if we write them. That was actually, I think that was Jordan that originally wrote them and it was passed over to Chocolatey. Um, Joe Francis now takes care of that. But the actual Chocolatey, Chocolate uses Ansible internally for all of our configuration management. And I started using that one. To give you a little bit of history of me, I'm now the technical engineer manager, but previously I was a senior technical engineer and I basically was in charge of ops. Ops was my thing. And I brought Ansible in there. So I wrote, I think it was like, by the time I'd started and finished, it was like 5,000 lines of, of Ansible. It was only a few months because it just, it got quite infectious. I really enjoy working on Ansible. So I wrote the internal stuff. Um, I haven't worked on the external stuff yet. But uh, Joel takes care of that mainly. So that was actually just a setup. Um, a setup question. Uh, my question actually is: um, Do you have lots of use cases to write your custom modules? Uh, Windows custom modules. So yes, the reason I'm asking is because the the out of box Windows modules and the uh, community collection as well actually cover a lot of things. They do, they do cover uh, an awful lot of things, but there's just when I've been using, I use it actually to provision my own machines. If I talk about not chocolate and kind of my personal use of it, um, to provision my own machines, and there's a lot of um, software. So you can install the software with chocolate, for example, using that chocolate uh, Ansible collection. And then you can configure the software. So Notepad++ is a classic one for me. So there's a configuration file. So I've actually got a role that configures Notepad++, and uh, it's got the, a template in there with the configuration file that I can put in there. Um, so there is, Ansible doesn't cover everything. There'll always be within organizations things that it just won't cover. There'll be special use cases um, and things like that. So it, it, there's the flexibility is there, but the, the community stuff is, covers an awful lot. 
an awful lot. It, it, it's a bit like if you're looking for a chocolatey pack, you know, you want to install some software. If you look for a chocolatey package, nine times out of ten it's there. It's a bit like that for, for Ansible. Nine times out of ten, there's somebody's already written it. And while it might not be in Ansible Galaxy, it might be in GitHub, because you can pull that stuff down as well, um, just as easily as you can from Ansible Galaxy. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Cool. Manfred. So the question is, do you need the Ansible control node when you're running against Windows? Um, I'm going to say, you sound like you know you don't. I never have, I don't know why you wouldn't need to. You would need to use Ansible to run the code against um, the Windows host. I can't, I, do you know different? Oh, okay. It's, no, I, you know, no, I don't think there's any, any way you, you could run, um, Ansible code on a Windows machine without the Ansible control mode. You would need that there. But as I said, the, the, you know, you think, oh, you have to stand up a Linux server and this, that. No, you just run it from WSL. That's what I did in the demos. And that's how when I'm actually testing Ansible code, um, when I was writing it for Chocolatey, that's how I was testing it, just running it through Ansible. And then I was moving it on to, we used Ansible Tower at the time. I was moving it in there. So it's a good way to test your code as well. Anybody else got any questions? No? Okay. Um, these, when my slides are available, these are resources. I'm not going to go through these, but you know, you, these are clickable links. But this is my details. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me today. If you have any more questions, you can get me outside. Okay. <laughs>